Okay. And then I need to stop the transcription. Okay. I must have mentioned in the last meeting that today's class is normally the most challenging of the semester, but not, we normally deal with it in a way that ensures we grab everything we should without having two meetings. I'd also explained at the beginning of the semester that the first half of the semester is to prepare us for the second. So in the first half, we we're just learning a couple of things here and there in language. We learned uh, speech at types of passages, uh, normative and empirical, you know, statements that you know can be interpreted in non-literal ways. Um, senses of law, uh, types of disagreements. Now we are done with all that. Today we are starting logic. That's critical thinking. And um, it begins with deductive reasoning. So, there are different forms of reasoning. Arguments are also called reasoning or syllogisms. The three terms are used interchangeably. You can use arguments or reasoning or syllogisms interchangeably. And there are two major categories. We have deductive and we have inductive. So we have either deductive reasoning or argument or syllogism, and then you have the inductive arguing or reasoning or syllogism. We also have causal reasoning, but it's a form of inductive reasoning. That one, we're going to see it in two weeks' time. So what we have are two categories, inductive, deductive. Now, the deductive is also called deductive argument, deductive syllogism. It is a reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is a logical relationship. That's what deductive reasoning. Reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is a logical relationship. The relationship is not logical in the other one, inductive reasoning. So that's the difference between the two. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. Logical means that it, it works like mathematics, like a mathematical operation. Two plus two, four, three plus five, uh, uh, you know, eight. That's how it works. As a result of this, it is reasoning that permits only one conclusion because it is a logical relationship. It is a reasoning that permits only one conclusion. In mathematics, you don't have two conclusions. Two plus two has one conclusion. Two plus four has one conclusion. Five plus five has one conclusion. That's what we call a logical relationship. Now, you will not see this explanation about one conclusion in the required text. I had to get it from the other text at uh, the... Kingdom bookshops uh, beside the BAM library. So the relationship between the premises and conclusion is a logical one. And because of that, it is a reasoning that permits only one conclusion. Example, all men are mortal. Kofi is a man, therefore Kofi is mortal. Now look at the argument carefully. All men are mortal. Kofi is a man, therefore Kofi is mortal. You can't change or modify the conclusion. You can say, for example, Kofi is immortal. Or a fire cabinet is mortal. You can't do that. It's just Kofi is mortal. If you look at premises one and two, you find two terms. You have men and you have Kofi. Sorry, you have men, you have mortal. 
Those are the two concepts, men and mortal. In premise two, you have Kofi, which is a third concept. So you have men, mortal, and Kofi. If you look at premise one, men and mortal appear once each. Premise two, Kofi and men appear once. So between premises one and two, men as a concept appeared twice. And between premises one and two, Kofi appeared once, mortal appeared once. So one of the three concepts appeared twice, the other two appeared only once. Logically, the conclusion will be made up of those ones that appeared only once, and that is mortal and Kofi. You simply draw them down and they form the conclusion. In that way, all the three terms or concepts appear twice each. That's what makes it a logical argument. Uh, so you can't come to the conclusion and say, no, you will not use Kofi, or you will not use mortar. It's just like mathematics. And the structure of premises one and two tell you that Kofi is going to be the subject and mortal is going to be the predicate. So the subject and the predicate in the conclusion is already decided by looking at premise one and then looking at premise two. That tells you what is going to be the subject of the conclusion and the predicate. So you simply bring them down there. That's why we say deductive argument is an argument where the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical and as a result of that it's the argument that permits only one conclusion and that conclusion is just there kofi is mortal now let's understand certain terms that make that operation possible first of all we're going to look at um, the difference between reference and attribute classes there are two parts of a sentence, just like the subject and a predicate. So in logic, we don't call the subject subject. We don't call the predicate predicate. In logic, we call the subject of a sentence the reference class. And the, and the predicate, we call it the attribute class. For example, all men are mortal. All men is a reference class. That's what we call the subject. Our motto is the attribute class, which we normally call the predicate. Now, the reference class is that to which the sentence refers. That's why we call it a reference class. And that, that's why that, that, that term has been uh, fabricated to, you know, to suit the, the, the business, you know. So... We prefer that to subject and predicate. The reference class is that to which the sentence refers. That's why we call it reference class. While the attribute class is that part of the sentence that is attributing something to or something about the reference class. So the reference class is that part of the sentence that is being referred to. Something is being referred, you know, it's uh, it, the reference is being made to it. You know. The reference is about all men. And then the other part of the sentence is attributing something to the reference class. Our mortal is to attribute something to all men. Now let's understand finite and infinite reference classes. So when you come to reference classes, you have two classes. You have the finite and infinite. The finite and infinite. The infinite reference class refers to all members or no members of a class, either 100% or 0%. The infinite reference class refers to all members or no members of a class, either 100% or 0%. Example, all men, no man, any man, that's the infinite reference class. It is a class that contains uncountable number of items. The number of items in the infinite reference class cannot be counted. All men cannot be counted. No man can be counted. Any man cannot be counted. So because 
It is a class that contains uh, uncountable number of items. We call it the infinite reference class. Then the finite reference class refers to countable and particular members of a class. Anything between 0% and 100%. The finite reference class refers to countable and particular members of a class. Anything between 0% and 100%. Example, some men that can be counted. 80% 80 of men can be counted. Five men. All the men. Now, all the men is different from all men. When you say all the men, with a definite article in between all the men, it means all the men in a certain location. All the men in this class, all the men in this town, all the men in this place. So all the men contains countable number of items. Few men, almost all the men. So these are all countable. So you have the infinite and the finite reference classes. Then you have the universal and particular statements. The universal and particular statements. Statements containing the infinite reference class are called universal statements. While those containing the finite reference classes are called the particular statements. Statements containing the infinite reference class are called the universal statements, whereas those containing the finite reference class are called the particular statements. Example of universal statements, all men are mortal. All men are mortal, that's a universal statement. Example of particular statements, some men drink alcohol. Some men drink alcohol, that's a particular statement. It contains a finite or countable reference class. So the universal statement contains infinite or uncountable reference class, and then the particular statements contain finite or countable reference class. A little exercise, which statements are universal and which are particular? This table is three-legged. Is it universal or particular? Someone answer that quickly so that we move on. Raise your hand up, Peter. This table is three-legged, universal or particular? Um, Paul, Paul Tete. The police particular. Particular. Tables can be sat on. Tables can be sat on. Ah, uh, Prisla, Prisla. This is universal. 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 James and Mary. Uh, fine. James and Mary passed the examination. James and Mary passed the examination. Uh, Selma. Selma, quickly. Is that Selma That's... or Selina? Is that Selina? Selina, yes, Selina. So, quickly, James and Mary passed the examination. Particular. Okay, and Kofi, all visitors should be treated with respect. Kofi, all visitors should be treated with, with respect. Universal. Universal. Good. Okay, fine. So we move on. Raise down your hands. Raise down your hands. Now let's look at validity. Validity. Or oh, an argument is valid. Oh, there should be that should be a, a an instead of an a. Um, so raise your hand. Uh, bring down your hands until the next um, uh, uh, exercise. An argument is valid if the premises make the conclusion necessary. Now we're looking at validity. An argument is valid if the premises made the conclusion necessary and the conclusion follows with certainty. Understand it carefully. An argument is valid if the premises make the conclusion necessary and the conclusion follows with certainty. If you look at two plus two, they make the conclusion for necessary and the conclusion for follows with what? Certainty. All valid arguments are deductive arguments, so inductive arguments are strictly not valid. All valid arguments are deductive arguments, so inductive arguments are strictly not valid. So only deductive arguments are valid. Only deductive arguments are valid. Uh, 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 
Okay, so Batenga Kwasi, Dakomin Kun Stacy and uh, Feka Vasco, your hands are raised. Um so, so is it about the yeah, exercise sure or is. something else? Uh, come so, back. It's something else. The, the flies are not moving. They, they are not sure moving, but you are seeing them. Okay, so who can yes, see these slides? Can anyone see these slides? I can see. Yes, okay, so I if, can. If, okay, so if you can see it, if someone can see it, then it means that uh, the problem doesn't come from my end. You have to check your end and see. Uh, it's okay now. Okay, Thank you. so if you cannot okay, see okay. the slides, please check your device before we move on so that you don't lose information. So we're talking about validity. and I, Okay, so thank you for bringing that up because it has saved us some, uh, some, some losses. Uh, you know. Yeah, you can describe them as losses. If someone didn't get some information, that's a loss. So validity, an argument is valid if the premises made the conclusion necessary and the conclusion follows with certainty. So I was saying that two plus two make four necessary and then four as a conclusion follows with certainty. All valid arguments are deductive arguments. So inductive arguments are strictly not valid. A, a deductive argument is a purely mathematical argument. And we say the relationship between the premises and conclusion is logical. Okay, so you can look at the example we had. All men are mortal, Kofi is a man, Kofi is mortal. This is a purely mathematical operation. There's nothing you can do about the conclusion. If you want to do something about the conclusion, you can only go and change something in the premises. Okay. But as long as the premises are, are the way they are, you can't manipulate the conclusion. Okay. Let's compare it to an inductive argument. So this is an inductive argument, premise one. 95% of men are honest. Two, Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. So this is an inductive argument. Premise one tells us that 95% of men are honest. So by implication, 5% are not honest. Then premise two tells us Peter is a man. So Peter could be in the 95% that are honest, or Peter could be in the 5% that are dishonest. We don't know about that one. The, the information doesn't give us that. Conclusion, Peter is honest. Peter is honest. So you can see that more than one conclusion is possible. Possible conclusion one, Peter is honest. Possible conclusion two, Peter is not honest. Whenever an argument generates the possibility of more than one conclusion, then it is an inductive argument. Inductive arguments are arguments that generate more than one possible conclusion. Okay. The hidden conditional if and then. So there are two ways of looking at arguments. You can look at them as in categorical or conditional ways conditionals so you can you, you can you can uh, you know present a categorical version of an argument or you can present a conditional version now all arguments all arguments have hidden conditionals and because of that you can convert a categorical argument into a conditional argument and vice versa okay look at the categorical statement all men are mortal categorical statement, all men are mortal. Convert it to a conditional statement. If something is a man, then it is mortal. 
if something is a man, then it is mortal. That's a conditional version of all men are mortal. So categorical statement, all men are mortal, conditional statement, if something is a man, then it is mortal. Now change the categorical statement of premise one to a conditional statement. So you, you have premise one, if something is a man, then it's mortal. Premise two, Peter is a man. Conclusion, therefore, Peter is mortal. So if you want to change an argument to a conditional version, you just change the premise one, or what I call the, the major premise. Premise one is a major premise. We'll call it the major premise. Now, the major premise is not always premise one. You can bring up premise two to one, and then premise one goes to two. It's still the same thing. But what, what, what's important is to know which one is the major premise. The major premise is the one you can convert to a conditional. The major premise is the one you can convert to a conditional. Um, I'll think of, about making that an additional slide after this slide and then adding it so that it will be clearer. The major premise is the premise that you can convert into a conditional. The other premise is not normally convertible to a conditional. You can't convert premise two to a conditional. Peter is a man, you can't convert it to a conditional. You can only convert all men are mortal to a conditional. So it is that premise you can convert to a conditional that is the major premise. And then the other one is the minor premise. So please bear that in mind as we move on. Now let's replace it with symbols. Categorical version, all men are mortal, all A's are B's. Peter is a man, X is an A. Peter is mortal, X is a B. We are converting it to symbols, or let's say we are replacing words with symbols. Categorical version, all men are mortal, all A's are B's. Peter is a man, X is an A. Peter is mortal, X is a B. So men or man is represented by A. Mortal is represented by B. And then Peter is represented by X. So you have A, B, and X representing men, mortal, and Peter. All A's are B's. X is an A, X is a B. Conditional version. If something is a man, then it's mortal. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is mortal. If A, then B. X is an A, therefore X is a B. But normally we just write if A, A then B. A, therefore B. Okay. So keep that in mind because we're going to be using it. Then antecedents and consequence. Antecedents and consequence. Now let's remember the reference class and the attribute class. The reference class and the attribute class. If we restate any categorical proposition as a conditional statement, the reference class becomes the antecedent and the attribute class becomes the consequence. If you restate any categorical proposition, which we call the major premise as a conditional statement. The reference class becomes the antecedent and the attribute class becomes a consequence. So by implication, whenever you convert the major premise to a conditional statement, the reference class is the antecedent. The, the attribute class is the consequence. You know that by reference class, we mean the subject, and by attribute class, we mean the predicate. So example, all A are B, all A are B, or if A, then B. The reference class in this case, A, is the antecedent, and the attribute class in this case, B, is the consequent. So A is the antecedent, and B is the consequent. All A are B. The conditional is if A, then B. A is a reference class, so we call it the antecedent. And then B is the attribute class, we call it the consequent. This applies to only the statement that you can convert to a conditional. It doesn't apply to any statement that is not convertible to a conditional. 
So any statement referring to A, or let's say any other statement referring to A, will be either affirming or denying the antecedent. And any statement referring to B will be either affirming or denying the consequent. That's the reason why we partition it into antecedent and consequent. Now, all A are B, or if A, then B. A is antecedent, B is consequent. Any statement referring to A, for instance, X is A or X is not A, is either affirming or denying the antecedent. And any statement referring to B, for example, X is B, X is not B, is either affirming or denying the consequent. Let's look at an example. X is an A, affirms the antecedent. X is not an A, denies the antecedent. X is a B, affirms the consequent. X is not a B, denies the consequent. Okay, so let's look at affirming the antecedent. All A's are B's, X is an A. That affirms the antecedent. Therefore, X is a B. All A's are B's. X is an A. That affirms the antecedent. Therefore, X is a B. Now, you can see that the minor premise is affirming the antecedent. Because of that, we say that the whole argument is an argument that affirms the antecedent. The entire argument is an argument that affirms the antecedent. So this is an example of an argument that affirms the antecedent. Denying the antecedent. All A's and B's, X is not an A. Now, X is not an A, denies the antecedent. Then the conclusion is S is not a B. Therefore, S is not a B. Now, so you can see that the minor premise is denying the antecedent of the major premise. Because of that, we say that the whole argument denies the antecedent. So this is an example of an argument that denies the antecedent. You, you can say it's an argument that denies the antecedent. Affirming the consequent. All A's are B's. X is a B. That affirms the consequent. X is a B, therefore X is an A. So we say that the whole argument affirms the consequent. It's an example of an argument that affirms the consequent. Denying the consequent. All A's are B's, X is not a B. That denies the consequent. So we say it's an example of an argument that denies the consequent. Or you can say this is an argument that denies the consequent. Now let's look at the rule for deductive reasoning. So we have just one rule for deductive reasoning. So we affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. We only affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. Any other operation will make the argument lose its validity. We only affirm the antecedent. So if you deny the antecedent, the argument will lose the validity. And then we deny the consequent in order to. So if you affirm the consequent, the argument will lose its validity. You can only make a correct deductive argument by either affirming the antecedent or denying the consequent. The other two, denying the antecedent, and affirming the consequent are what we call formal fallacies. They are deductive fallacies. They will lead you to fallacious conclusions. We're going to see the examples. So this is the rule. We only affirm the antecedent and deny the consequent in order to reach a valid conclusion. Example, all A's are B's. X is an A, affirms the antecedent. X is a B, is a valid argument. So this is an example of an argument that affirms the antecedent. All A's are B's. X is not an A. That denies the antecedent. X is not a B. So this is not a valid argument. Let's convert it to words and see. All Ghanaians are Africans. 
all Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is a Ghanaian. That affirms the antecedent. Peter is a Ghanaian, affirms the antecedent. Therefore, Peter is an African. So we say this is an, a valid argument. Why is it valid? We'll understand that when we look at the second example. All Ghanaians are Africans. Peter no. is not a Ghanaian. That denies the antecedent. Therefore, Peter is not an African. It's not a valid argument. Now, why is the second example not valid? All Ghanaians are Africans. <clears throat> Peter is not a Ghanaian. Uh, Therefore, that. Peter is not an African. Uh, you know, Okay. So, naturally, your interest would be to understand the second example, denying the antecedent. All Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is not a Ghanaian. Therefore, Peter is not an African. We say the argument is not valid. The argument is wrong or is fallacious. Uh, so why is it fallacious? You can see why it is fallacious by looking at it closely and using your common sense. All Ghanaians are Africans, which is true. All Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is not a Ghanaian. So Peter is not a Ghanaian. So that one we are sure of, that Peter is not a Ghanaian. Therefore, Peter is not an African. Now, the argument is asking us to believe that Peter is not an African simply because he's not a Ghanaian. The problem is whether the argument is correct. If Peter is not a Ghanaian, is that proof to conclude he's not an African? Now, if Peter is not a Ghanaian, it's not enough to conclude that he's not an African. Because if he's not a Ghanaian, then he could be a European. So when you say Peter is not an, a, a Ghanaian as a reason for saying he's not an African, the, the reasoning is not valid. Because not being a Ghanaian is not enough reason to conclude that he is not an African. Uh, so, if Peter is not a Ghanaian, it's not enough reason to exclude him from being an African because he could be from any other African country. Now, let's let's uh, let's suppose that all Ghanaians are Africans. Peter is not a Ghanaian, therefore Peter is not an African. And then you later discover that Peter is actually uh, a Cameroonian. That is when you know that this argument is wrong. So the fact that Peter is not a Ghanaian is not enough reason to conclude that he's not an African. But you can see that the first example is correct. Because Peter is a Ghanaian, therefore Peter is an African. If Peter is a Ghanaian, then surely he's an African. That's why we say you can only make a valid argument by affirming the antecedent. If you affirm the antecedent, the argument will be correct. But if you deny the antecedent, the argument will not be valid. So I want to use some diagrams or boxes to show you in a, in a more graphic way how it works. Now, let's look at the technicality. The consequent is always a larger class of denotations or members compared to the antecedent. Consequent contains the denotations of both the antecedent and possibly more. So the consequent Africans contains more members than the antecedent Ghanaians. When you deny something of membership in a smaller class, you have not denied it of membership in the larger class. So let's go back. The consequent. First of all, the major premise is all Ghanaians are Africans. That's where you know the antecedent and the consequence. So the consequence is Africans. The antecedent is Ghanaians. We are being told that the consequent is always a larger class compared to the antecedent. The consequent always contains everything in the antecedent and possibly more. 
So you, the antecedent can be swallowed up in the consequent. And then the consequent can take in more. Of course, you know that Africans contain more than Ghanaians. So if you affirm something of membership in the antecedent, automatically you have affirmed it of membership in the consequent because everything in the antecedent is in the consequent. But if you deny something of membership in the antecedent, you have not automatically denied it of membership in the antecedent because if that thing is not in the antecedent, it could be in something else that is in the consequent. After all, the consequent is larger than the antecedent. We'll see that when we we'll see some boxes. OK, so when you deny something of membership in a smaller class, you've not denied it of membership in the larger class. But when you deny something of membership in the larger class, containing all the members of a smaller class, you have automatically denied it of membership in the smaller class. OK, so um, <clears throat> let, let me skip to the argument, uh, to, the, to the diagrams. Now, we have two boxes. We have a bigger box called the consequent, containing the consequent. We have a smaller box containing the antecedent. Now, in our example, the consequent is Africans. The antecedent is Ghanaians. And uh, we have explained that everything, the consequent is normally larger than the antecedent. In this case, African is larger than Ghanaians. If you say Peter is a Ghanaian, if you say Peter is a Ghanaian, automatically he's, in the, he's an African because you can see that everything in the Ghanaian box is in the African box. So anyone who is in the Ghanaian box is in the African box. So when you affirm the antecedent, Peter is a Ghanaian. That, that would make the conclusion valid that Peter is an African. But if you deny the antecedent, Peter is not a Ghanaian. You are not sure whether you can deny him of being an African. If you say Peter is not a Ghanaian, that's not enough reason to say, yeah, okay, so because of that, Peter is not an African. Because he could be in any other other part of the African box apart from the Ghanaian. You can be sure that Peter is an African by simply identifying him as a Ghanaian. But you cannot deny that Peter is an African simply by denying Peter of being in the Ghanaian box. That's how it works. So you can get these explanations from the other uh, logic uh, textbook, the other critical thinking book. OK, so now let's look at four kinds of deductive arguments. Four kinds of deductive arguments. The four of them are actually the four ways of um, making an argument, um, affirming the antecedent, denying the antecedent, affirming the consequent, denying the consequent. OK, so now the first type of deductive argument is, is called the modus ponens. The modus ponens. Modus ponens is an argument that affirms the antecedent. An argument that affirms the antecedent is called modus ponens. All A's are B's. If something is an A, then it's a B. X is an A. Therefore, X is a B. All Ghanaians are Africans. If someone is if someone is a Ghanaian, then he's an African. Peter is a Ghanaian, affirms the antecedent. Therefore, Peter is an African. So modus ponens is a valid argument, an argument that affirms the antecedent. Now the fallacy of denying the antecedent. All A's are B's, X is not an A, therefore X is not a B. All Ghanaians are Africans, Peter is not a Ghanaian, therefore Peter is not an African. So we said it's not a valid argument. Peter could possibly be a Cameroonian, and that makes Peter an African. So this is a fallacy of denying the antecedent. So 
We've already seen these two diagrams, the consequence, the antecedents. And the consequence in this example is Africans, the antecedent is Ghanaians. So anything in the Ghanaian box is automatically in the African box. But if something is not in the Ghanaian box, you can't say it's not in the African box because you've not verified whether it is absent from all the other parts of the African box. So saying that something is not an African because it's not in the Ghanaian box is, is not a valid argument. That's why we say that denying the antecedent would not lead you to a valid conclusion. Now let's look at modus tollens. All A are B, X is not a B. Therefore, S is not an A. So modus tollens is an argument that denies the, the, the consequence. An argument that denies a consequence is a modus tollens. If A, therefore B, not B, therefore not A. So that's an argument that denies a consequence. And it leads to a valid conclusion. All Ghanaians are Africans. So we're converting into words. All Ghanaians are Africans. Michael is not an African. So that denies the consequence. Michael is not an African. Therefore, Michael is not a Ghanaian. So we said this, this is a valid argument. Now, all Ghanaians are Africans. Michael is not an African. So if Michael is not an African, then there's no way Michael will be a Ghanaian. Now, let's go back to the, the two boxes. The Ghanaian box is within the African box. All Ghanaians are Africans. If you say Michael is not an African, then it means automatically he cannot be a Ghanaian. Because he's, it means Michael is nowhere in the African box, and that includes the Ghanaian box. That's why we say that denying the consequent leads to a valid conclusion. Michael is not an African, so he cannot be a Ghanaian. Okay, so look at the... the the symbols, all A are B, X is not a B, therefore X is not an A. If A, then B, not B, therefore not A. All Ghanaians are Africans. Michael is not an African, therefore Michael is not a Ghanaian. So this is a valid argument. So modus tollens, denying the consequent, is a valid argument. Now let's look at this second example. All those studying in the Department of Physics are enrolled at the University of Ghana. All those studying in the Department of Physics, all those studying in the Department of Physics are enrolled at the University of Ghana. Kelvin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana. So Kelvin is not studying in the Department of Physics. Now you can convert this argument into symbols. The major premise is all those studying in the Department of Physics are, are enrolled at the University of Ghana. So um, anyone, if, if someone is studying in the Department of Physics, then that person is enrolled at the University of Ghana. That's the conditional. If someone is studying in the Department of Physics, then such a person is enrolled at the University of Ghana. So studying in the Department of Physics is the antecedent. Enrolled at the University of Ghana is the consequence. Now, Kelvin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana. So this is an argument that denies the consequent. It denies the consequent. So just imagine that there is a debate about Kelvin. Some people are saying Kelvin is in physics. Some people are saying, no, Kelvin is in chemistry. Some people are saying, no, Kelvin is... Uh, Kevin is in physics, he's not in chemistry. And somebody insists, no, he's not in physics, he's in chemistry. And the argument continues. And then along the line, someone decides to go to the registry to check whether Kevin is enrolled at the University of Ghana. The person goes to registry, and then the registry announces that Kevin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana. What happens to the debate? about whether it's in physics or chemistry. 
the argument is automatically dissolved. It becomes meaningless because if Kelvin is not enrolled at the University of Ghana, then there's no way he can be in physics. It's just like saying if, some, if someone is not an African, then there's no way of saying he is a Ghanaian. So when you deny the consequence, which is usually a larger box of items compared to the antecedent, you automatically you have denied the antecedent. So look at the University of Ghana, look at the Department of Physics. The Department of Physics is a smaller box inside a bigger box called University of Ghana. If someone is not enrolled in the bigger box, then there's automatically, you can't prove that there's no way he can be in the smaller box. The fallacy of affirming the consequent. All A or B, all A or B, X is a B. Now, X is a B affirms the consequent. X is a B affirms the consequent. Therefore, X is an A. So we say this is a fallacy. Let's put it in words. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Ghanaians are Africans. George is an African. He's a Ghanaian. All Ghanaians are Africans. George is, a, is an African. George is an African. Therefore, George is a Ghanaian. So this argument is telling us that well, if you see, once you can prove that someone is an African, then automatically the person is a Ghanaian. The question is whether that is true, and we know it's not. So you can't say that someone is a Ghanaian just by proving that the person is an African, because there are many Africans apart from Ghanaians. When you affirm the consequent, it can't lead you to a valid conclusion because the consequent is large, larger than the antecedent. Saying that someone is part of the consequent doesn't automatically mean he is part of the antecedent. Okay, look at um, look at the, the boxes, Africans and Ghanaians. So if you prove that George is an African, that George is anywhere in this big box called Africans, now automatically you have have you proved he's a Ghanaian? You have not. So that's why I would say that affirming the consequent cannot lead you to a valid conclusion. It, it can happen that George is also a Ghanaian, but that will be accidental. Arguments are not about accidents. OK. So affirming. Affirming the consequent will lead you to an invalid conclusion. Explanation. The consequent Africans contains a logically larger category of denotations compared to the antecedent Ghanaian. So the fact that George is an African does not necessarily mean that he's a Ghanaian. He may be a South African or a Cameroonian. If we affirm the, the consequent, we are not sure affirm the antecedent problem. If we affirm the consequent, we're not sure we can affirm the antecedent. In short, if we affirm the consequent, it will land us in the same uncertainty that we saw in the fallacy of um, denying the antecedent. Another form of the fallacy of affirming the consequent. So let's look at another form of the fallacy of affirming the consequent. All A are not B. All A are not B. X is not a B, therefore X is an A. All A are not B. X is not a B, therefore X is an A. Now you might think that this is an argument that denies the antecedent, but that's not the reality. The reality is that it is an argument that affirms the consequent. Why? Because the major premise is denying the antecedent. The major premise is denying the antecedent, and the minor premise is also denying the antecedent. Now, whenever you have two negatives, what do you have? Two negatives combined would give you a positive. So we have a negative negative. 
up there, we have a negative in premise one, we have the same negative in premise two. So when you combine them, it becomes an affirmation. So you say that the minor premise is actually affirming the major premise. The minor premise is affirming the major premise. The, the major premise is a denier, and the minor premise is a denier. So the minor premise is affirming the major premise. So that's another version of the fallacy of deny of affirming the con. So that when you see this in an examination or if you see it in your continuous assessment, uh, you don't be deceived into thinking that it's an argument that uh, denies the consequence. Whenever you have two negatives, they combine to give you a positive. If the major premise is denying something and the minor premise also denies the same thing, then the minor premise is actually affirming the major premise. In two words, all human beings are not goods. X is not a good, therefore X is a human being. All human beings are not goods. That denies the consequence. X is not a good, also denies the consequence. Therefore, X is a human being. Now, if all human beings are not goods, and X is also not a good, is that sufficient to prove that X is a human being? The answer is no. If you are a human being, then you are not a good. You are, you are not a good, therefore you are a human being. So this is another version of the argument, the conditional version. If you are a human being, then you are not a good. You are not a good, therefore you are a human being. At first you think the argument is correct, but if you look at it closely, you see that the argument is not correct. If you are a human being, then you're not a good. You are not a good, therefore you are not. Now, you are not a good, therefore you are a human being. If you are not a good, you could also be something else. You could be a tiger, a cow, a fish. You know. So again, not being a good is a logically larger category than all human beings. So the fact that X is not a good doesn't necessarily make X a human being. X could as well be a cat, giraffe, or tiger. Always remember that the consequent is a larger category of items compared to the antecedent. The antecedent, you know, the antecedent can normally be accommodated in the consequence. Unless premise is denied, but whether denial or affirmation, consequences are normally logically larger compared to the antecedent. Not in real life, but in logical relationships, in terms of uh, a logical argument. So that is the end of the four types of um, of um, you know affirming and denying. Affirming the antecedent is modus ponens. Denying the antecedent is the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Affirming the consequent is the fallacy of affirming the consequent. And then denying the consequent is modus tollens. So out of the four of them, the, there are two valid ones. The valid ones are modus ponens, and modus tollens. The invalid ones are called formal fallacies, so they are not part of the types. So now we have seen two types of deductive reasoning. We've seen modus ponens, affirming the antecedent, and then we've seen modus tollens, denying the antecedent, denying the consequent. Now let's look at a third, uh, a third type of deductive reasoning. We call it the hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism. Now, hypothetical syllogism is an argument where the consequent of an initial or first premise becomes the antecedent of a second or subsequent premise. The consequent of an initial or first premise becomes the antecedent of a second or subsequent premise. And subsequent premises feature the consequence of their predecessors as their antecedents. So the conclusion pairs the very first antecedent and the very last consequent. So 
a hypothetical syllogism is an, is, a, is an argument where the consequent of a premise becomes the antecedent of the next premise. Let's see how it works. All A are B, all B are C. So you can see that the consequent of the first premise has become the antecedent of the second one. And if you added another premise, it will be the same thing. Another premise will be all C are D. Another one will still be all D are E. It just goes on like that. At the end, you simply, the conclusion simply assembles the very first antecedent and the very last consequent. So in this case, the conclusion is therefore all A are C. So if you said all A are B, all B are C, the conclusion is all A are C. You can extend it down to Z. All A are B, all B are C, all C are D, all D are E, all E are F, all F are G, all G are H, and so on, until all Y are Z. And then the conclusion would be all A are Z. Let's look at the conditional. If A, then B. If A, then B. If B, then C. Therefore, if A, then C. That's a hypothetical argument. The consequent of a premise becomes the antecedent of the next premise. That's the technicality. That's how you identify a hypothetical argument. The consequent of a premise doesn't become the antecedent of the next premise in modus ponens or modus tollens or any other one. It is in political syllogism that the consequent of a premise becomes the antecedent of the next premise. That's why we call it the, a hypothetical argument. Let's put it in words. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Africans are human beings. Therefore, all Ghanaians are human beings. If you are Ghanaian, then you are a human being. Uh, sorry, if you are Ghanaian, then you are an African. If you are an African, then you are a human being. Therefore, if you are Ghanaian, then you are a human being. So that's a hypothetical argument. Explanation. We notice that the consequent of the first premise, which is B, becomes the antecedent of its second premise. And then the antecedent of the second premise, which is the consequent of the first premise, leads us to a new party, which is C as a consequent, you know, so it just continues like that. Any additional subsequent premise will typically feature the consequent of its predecessor as its antecedent, so that it is linked conditionally to a fresh party. Now let's look at two fallacies of hypothetical syllogism, or let's say two hypothetical fallacies. The first fallacy, all A are B, all B are C, Therefore, all C are A. Therefore, all C are A. Now, the conclusion says all C are A. Instead of all A are C, it says all C are A. Now, this might look like a minor fault, but you wouldn't realize how wrong it is until you put it in words. Now, I'll put it in words and see. All Ghanaians are Africans. All Africans are human beings. Therefore, all human beings are Ghanaians. So that's the consequent of trying to mess around with the, 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 the concepts, the terms in the conclusion. All human beings are Ghanaians, which is not true. If you are Ghanaian, then you are an African. If you are an African, then you are a human being. Therefore, if you are a human being, then you are a Ghanaian. So that's the first hypothetical fallacy. The second hypothetical fallacy, all A are C, all B are C, therefore all A are B. So this one involves more meddling around with the terms. All A are C, all B are C, therefore all A are B. Now this argument is asking us to accept that A and B could be the same, just because each of them has been equated to a C. Now, the fact that each of A and B have been equated to C doesn't still, it doesn't necessarily mean that A and B will be the same. Now, let's put it in words and see the consequent. Words, all Ghanaians are Africans. Mm -hmm. All Kenyans are Africans. 
All Ghanaians are Africans. All Kenyans are Africans. Therefore, all Ghanaians are Kenyans. So this is all A are C, all B are C, therefore all A are B. So here you can see how fallacious the argument is. All Ghanaians are Africans, all Kenyans are Africans, therefore all Ghanaians are Kenyans. If you're a Ghanaian, then you're an African. If you're a Kenyan, then you're an African. Therefore, if you're a Ghanaian, then you're a Kenyan. So there's, there's no way you can mess around with terms like that. So it can be true by accident. Ghanaians are human beings. Africans are human beings. Therefore, Ghanaians are Africans, you know. If you're a Ghanaian, then you're a human being. If you're an African, then you're a human being. Therefore, if you're a Ghanaian, then you're an African. Now, this is only true by accident. It is only accidentally true. It becomes a fallacy. You know, it, is a, it becomes a fallacy by changing the contents of the premise to the, uh, to, to the previous example. So if, you know, once you change the, the contents of the premises to the previous example, then you will see that it's a fallacy, you know. So um, we know that all Ghanaians are Africans, so the conclusion is true. But we did not get this conclusion from the two premises. We knew this conclusion before we saw this argument. So it is not this argument that gave us this true conclusion. The true conclusion does not come from the argument. The, the, the argument is still fallacious in spite of the fact that it has an accidental true conclusion. Now we're going to see more examples of fallacious arguments with accidental true conclusions. Uh, so, so now we've seen the two kinds of hypothetical fallacies. The first one is all A are B, all B are C, therefore all C are A, which is not correct. The second one is all A are C, all B are C, therefore all A are B, which is also not correct. So that these are called the, the two hypothetical fallacies. Now let's look at disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive syllogism. So this is the fourth kind of deductive reasoning. Disjunctive syllogism. This is a syllogism where the main premise is a disjunctive, either or. The main premise is a disjunctive, an either or statement. When we affirm something of any of the disjunctive items, then we have automatically denied it the other disjunctive part. Okay, so example, either A is true or B is true. A is true, so B is false. Or either A is true or B is true. B is true, so A is false. So let's put it in words, either I became a reverend father or I got married. I got married, so I did not become a reverend father. Or either I became a reverend father or I got married. I became a reverend father, so I did not get married. Okay. So that's how we call the disjunctive syllogism. If you say that one part of the disjunctive is true, then automatically the other part of the disjunct is false. So a little exercise, you know, to relax our minds. Determine what kind of argument this is. Determine what kind of argument this is. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. Today he passed by my mother's house, so he went to town. Premise one, any time he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. That's premise one. Premise two, today he's passed by my mother's house. Conclusion, so he went to town. So break this argument down. If you like, you can break it into symbols, work it out, and find out what kind of argument it is. Once you work it out, then raise your hand and you know uh, teach us what kind of argument it is. P please, quickly, someone should work it out and tell us.
Okay, so someone's hand is raised. VV, you may proceed. <coughs> VV, your hand is raised. And only your hand is raised. So could you put, you need to, all right, you have put on your mic. So let's get it, the answer. Yes, please, I wanted to ask, uh, if, it, if the slide we are reading is different from the one I'm having, that's why I wanted to know. Um, Can you see the slide? Yeah, I can see, but I think it's different from the one we have, I have on my, mm. on my phone. So I wanted to know maybe if you have your own slides and I can get that one from any place. Uh, I don't know the one you're talking about. I, I think that there are other, there should be other slides apart from this one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The other slide, the one you're reading from, is different from the one I'm having. That's why I'm asking if there is a place I can get yours. Okay, this one. Now, this one is part of the video. Um, so the, the thing is that we're not really allowed to share the slides or, you know, some of us have been instructed not to share our slides. That what we can do is to make a record our lecture, use it for the lecture and record it. So that um, uh, the only place you can see our slide is in the recording. So by watching the recording, you are also watching the slide. <coughs> okay. Uh, on YouTube. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll post it on YouTube and then send you the link. Uh, we couldn't post the last one, right. but we're trying to be sure that we can post this one. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, so thank you. Has anyone? All right. So has anyone worked out the argument, the type of argument? Um, Samson, Samson, I can see your hand raised. Yeah, Samson, could you proceed? Yeah, Samson, I'm waiting. Uh, I think you've opened your mic already. Okay, so whilst we're waiting for Samson, let's read out the argument again. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. Today he passed by my mother's house, so he went to town. So the first thing to determine is what is the major premise? The major premise should be the premise we can convert into a conditional. The major premise is a premise we can convert into a conditional. And in fact, one of the premises already look like a, a, a conditional. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by another's house. In fact, to make it uh, a pure conditional, you say, if he goes to town, if he goes to town, he passes by my mother's house. So that's a, so that's a conditional, and that makes it the major premise. So now, having known that it is the major premise, what part of it is the antecedent and what part is the consequence? The antecedent should be the first part. So if he goes to town, is the antecedent. Then he passes by my mother's house, is the consequent. Now, so having known the antecedent, goes to town and the consequent passes by my mother's house, what is the minor premise doing? Is it affirming or denying the antecedent or is it affirming or denying the consequent? Today, he passed by my mother's house. So the minor premise is affirming the consequence. Today, he passed by my mother's house, so he went to town. Now, so this is an argument that affirms the consequence. That means that the argument is not valid. The argument is not valid. Now, so having known by deductive rules, 
or deductive reasoning that this argument is not valid. You can then ask yourself, why is this argument not valid? And then you could read it again and see why. Anytime he goes to town, he passes by my brother's house. Today he passed by my brother's house, so he went to town. Now we know that if he's going to town, he must pass by your mother's house. But does it mean that if he passes your mother's house, then he must have gone to town? That's the question. And the answer is no. Passing your mother's house doesn't necessarily mean he has gone to town. There are many places he could stop before he reaches town when he passes by my, your mother's house. He might pass by your mother's house and then he stops next door. You know, so the fact that he must pass your mother's house before he goes to town doesn't mean that once he passes your mother's house, it means he has gone to town. So let's answer these questions correctly. Number one. We deduce correctly when we deny the antecedent, true or false. We deduce correctly when we deny the antecedent. True or false. So this one is something we have done directly. Paul Tete, true or false. Yeah, Paul, you want to answer that? We just when we deny the antecedent, true or false? Paul, are you there? This is false. Good. Number two, we deduce correctly when we affirm the antecedent. We deduce correctly when we affirm the antecedent. True or false? This is true. Okay, number three. We deduce correctly when we deny the consequent. True or false? True. false. Okay, true. Number four. We deduce correctly when we affirm the consequent. True uh, or false? This is false. This is false. Okay, false. false. Good. All right, so let's move on. Now let's look at um, validity versus soundness. Now, we need this section in order to understand deductive arguments completely. Validity versus soundness. The four types of deductive syllogism are four ways of making deductively valid arguments. The four types of deductive syllogism are four ways of making deductively valid arguments. So you have the modus ponens, affirming the antecedent. You have the modus tollens, denying the consequent. Then you have the hypothetical syllogism, and then you have the disjunctive syllogism. So these are, those are the four ways of making deductively valid arguments. Now, if valid argument is an argument whose premises are logically consistent with this conclusion, the premises of a valid argument necessarily imply its conclusion in a manner that it is impossible to deny the inference without running into self-contradiction. An invalid argument is an argument whose premises do not logically imply the conclusion. The relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not that of logical necessity. You can proceed to the conclusion of an invalid argument without contradicting yourselves. So the formal fallacies are invalid arguments. Now, so we've seen four deductive, uh, in the four types of deductive reasoning, modus ponens, modus tollens, uh, hypothetical syllogism, and then the disjunctive. We have also seen some fallacies. The fallacy of denying the antecedent, the fallacy of affirming the consequent, the two hypothetical fallacies. So that makes it four fallacies. We'll call them the formal fallacies the formal fallacies. Next week, we are going to start informal fallacies. So we have a different, we have a, a distinction between formal and informal fallacies. Now, an argument could be valid 
but it is not sound. An argument could be valid, but it is not sound. Validity is that the argument is technically correct. Validity is that an argument is, you know, is, is, uh, it, it, it is uh, either a modus tollens, modus ponens, hypothetical syllogism or disjunctive syllogism. So th those are the valid arguments. But if there is false information, if there is false information in the argument, then the argument is not sound, even though it is valid. An argument could be valid, but not sound. OK. All human beings are immortal. Peter is a human being, therefore Peter is immortal. All human beings are immortal. So that means all human beings can last forever. Peter is a human being, therefore Peter is immortal. Peter can last forever. This argument is valid because it is a correct modus ponens. It is an argument that affirms the antecedent. So it is a valid argument, but it is not sound because one of the premises is not true. It is not sound because one of the premises is not true. It is not true that all human beings are immortal. So this is an example of an argument that is valid, but not sound. Look at another example. All men are mammals. All mammals must get killed. Therefore, all men must get killed. All men are mammals. All mammals must get killed. Therefore, all men must get killed. Now, in the first place, what kind of argument is this? All men are mammals. Convert it to symbols. All men are mammals. All A are B. All A are B. All mammals must get killed. All B. Remember that mammals is B. So all B are C. Therefore, all A are C. So this is a hypothetical syllogism. Samson. Uh, are you raising your hand? Samson, did you just raise your hand? Okay. So let's let's um, look at it again. All men are mammals. All mammals are A are B. All B are C. Therefore, all A are C. So it's a hypothetical syllogism. So that means it is a valid argument. It is a valid argument. And the hypothetical syllogism is a valid one. So it is a valid argument, but is it a sound argument? No, it's not a sound argument because the second premise is not true. It's not true that all mammals must get killed. So this is an argument that is valid, but not sound. Yes. Now, invalid argument with true conclusion. And again, we, we saw it before, invalid argument with true conclusion. Invalid argument with true conclusion. Democracy is better than other forms of political organization because citizens in a democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization. Democracy is better than other forms of political organization because citizens in a democracy are holier than citizens in another form. So is it true? Um, now, before we ask whether it's true, let's determine parts of the argument. Now, this argument is, this is an argument, the conclusion and the premise are in one sentence. The conclusion and the premise are in one sentence, and you have only one premise. So this is a single premise argument, and both the premise and the conclusion are in one sentence. Not only that, it appears that the conclusion comes before the premise. Now, the conclusion is democracy is better than other forms of political organization. That's the conclusion. So it comes before, before the premise. And then the premise is because citizens in the democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization. Now, look at, look at the two parts of the argument. Is the conclusion true? 
democracy is better than other forms of political. Everyone believes the conclusion is true. So we can agree that the conclusion is true. What about the private democracy are holier than citizens in another form of political organization? So that is not true, you know, because there's no there's no society where the citizens are holier than in another society. So this is an example of a true conclusion with an invalid argument. So true conclusion alone does not make an invalid argument correct. Now, so you can say that the conclusion is true, but the argument is invalid. The conclusion is true, but the argument is invalid. And true conclusion alone cannot make an invalid argument correct. OK. Valid and sound. To be sound, all the premises in a valid argument must be true. To be sound, all the premises in a valid argument must be true. All men are mortal. Peter is a man. Therefore, Peter is mortal. So this argument is sound. It is valid because it affirms the antecedent. And it is sound because all the statements, all the premises are true. So we have three forms. We have valid and sound, valid and unsound, invalid and unsound. Valid and sound. All snakes are reptiles. Cobra is a snake. Therefore, cobra is a reptile. So this is an argument that affirms the antecedent. So it is valid. It is also sound because all the premises are correct. Valid because it, it, it follows the correct rule for deductive reasoning, affirming the antecedent that it is true because the premises are true. Now, valid but unsound, valid but unsound. All snakes are reptiles, that's true. Mosquitoes, that's false, therefore, mosquitoes are reptiles. Now, this is an argument that uh, affirms the antecedent, so it is correct. It is valid because it follows the correct rule of deductive reasoning that affirms the antecedent, but it's unsound because one of the premises is not true. Now you can have both invalid and unsound, which is a double jeopardy. All snakes are reptiles. That's true. Mosquitoes are reptiles. That's not true. Therefore, mosquitoes are snakes. This is an argument that affirms the consequence. So it is invalid. The premises are also false. One of the premises is false, so it is unsound. So it is both invalid and unsound. Invalid because the argument affirms the consequence. Unsound because one of the premises is not, not true. And all the technicalities of determining valid and sound arguments. Is an invalid but sound argument possible? No. An invalid argument is unsound, even if the premises and conclusion are all true. All Ghanaians are Africans. Kofi is an African, therefore, Kofi is a Ghanaian. So this argument is invalid. And the argument is unsound because uh, the 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 lack of validity invalidates the argument. Now, technicality, validity is needed for soundness. Validity is needed for soundness, but soundness is not needed for validity. Some arguments are valid but not true. You can also see a lot of that in real life. Soundness needs both validity and truth.
So let's do a little exercise. Identify the missing premise in each of the inductive arguments. Now, these arguments are supposed to contain three statements, three sentences. One is missing. So identify the premise that is missing. All military men play football. Bob plays football. All military men play football. Bob plays football. What's the missing premise? Someone should answer that. Bob is a military man. Bob is a military man. That's correct. Second one, all Americans are human beings. All Americans are human beings. All Americans are members. What's the All mamas are Americans. All, all what? All mamas are Americans. All mamas are all human beings are mammals. All human beings are mammals. All human beings are mammals. All Americans are human beings. All, all Americans are mammals. Are mammals. Therefore, all Americans are members. So you just determine which of the three terms or concepts occurred only once and then join them together to form the conclusion. So here you can see that Americans have occurred twice, human beings were called once, members were called once. So the conclusion will be made up of human beings and members or rather the, the missing premise will be made up of human beings and members. All right, answer correctly. Which fallacy is committed by the following? All A's are C's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are B's. All A's are C's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are B's. Hypothetical syllogism. Hypothetical syllogism. Uh, but when you say hypothetical syllogism, you are not completely right. What you say is hypothetical fallacy. You know, it's one of the it's one of the hypothetical fallacies. Um, remember that when we say hypothetical syllogism, we are referring to Hypothetical syllogisms that are correct. All right. Describe the following arguments. All Europeans are not my friends. Ben is not a European, therefore Ben is my friend. Or look at the second version. No European is my friend. No European is my friend. Ben is not a European, therefore Ben is my friend. So what kind of argument is it? What, what type of uh, axiologism is it? What, what type of reasoning? Hypothetical Okay, so let me take that up. No European is my friend. Ben is not a European. So when you look at that, you see that the, the first premise is a negation of Europeans. The second premise is also a negation of Europeans. 
And then the major premise is what? The major premise is no European is my friend. So European is the antecedent. European is the antecedent. So if the major premise denies the antecedent, and the minor premise is also denying the antecedent, then what it means is what? Is that Rebecca? Yes, sir. Sir, please, no. some of us are just joining the class and I don't know what we are treating. Uh, you don't do what? Some of us are just joining the class. Uh, then you, you you just have to be you, you just have to follow us until the end. Um, the, the only way to understand the class is to watch the recording. So I think you guys are gonna be uh, served by you guys are gonna be redeemed by the recording of the class. So we are hoping that we can retrieve the recording after the class because. I've not been able to retrieve the recording of last week you know, up till now, but I'm just hoping that with some changes we've made, we can retrieve the recording of this class. So relax and um, continue till the rest of the class. Watch the recording later. Okay, so this is an <laughs> argument. This is an argument that affirms the antecedent. It is an argument that affirms the antecedents because the major premise is a negation of Europeans and European is the antecedent. The minor premise is also a negation of the antecedent. So it means the minor premise is affirming the major premise. So this argument is a modus ponens. So that's the end of the class. We shall do inductive reasoning next week. And um, until then, uh, I would entreat you to watch your lecture videos regularly. Watch different videos on each topic to gain multiple perspectives. And uh, OK. So now we would entertain um, any questions. If you have any questions arising from not understanding a particular thing, you can come up with it. But if you don't understand the whole class or a, a part of the class, then you have to either watch the videos or watch the videos and then ask your tutor for more tutorials. But, uh, do you have a question? Your, 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 your hand is raised. So can you put on your mic? Okay. So now I'm going to stop the recording so that I can anxiously wait for the record at uh, the the record. Um, okay, so two hands have been raised. One has been lowered. Boachi do you want to ask a question? Okay, so let me proceed to stop the recording. <laughs>